We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. If you mean true for you is different from true for anybody else. Have yeah, to come to absolutely, you. because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Good evening, citizens of Netlandia. Welcome to Or Really Radio, show 143, recorded Friday, February 10th, 2017, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really. I'm your host, Andy Kellen, with my usual suspects. I've got Stephen Griffith, Amber Besecker, Fred Sims, Daniel Atherton, and JP. Welcome, one and all, and JP, of course, for being the newbie. Please be gentle with me. No problem. Not really. No promises at all. Uh, it's, J- it's fine. JP is uh, is getting a little famous, a little internet famous, by running the Alt Department of Education Twitter feed. And it just uh, crashed. Uh, okay. Well, at least I got the introduction in. So as soon as her... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as soon as her computer comes back online, then we down. will go to my desktop. We will enjoy uh, in, enjoy her her uh, her musings on things. Um, in the meantime, audience <laughs> feedback from previous shows and any feedback that you happen to have uh, have, uh, please. Uh, we do make mistakes. If you find said mistakes, uh, go ahead and, and send us a note at oreallyradiopodcast at gmail dot com. Or you can phone it in at 470-222-6759. We'd like to shout out to our Patreon supporters. We have Donald Davis, Melissa G., Henry. I can't figure out what Henry's last name is, but thank you, Henry. And Daniel Duncan and Dan Smith. Thank you all for supporting our efforts to um, try and inform you and educate you all at the same time. It ain't easy sometimes. But thank you very much. And if you would like to count yourself among our patrons, you can contribute to the show at, uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, Patreon.com slash O'Reilly Radio. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. O'Reilly Radio. O-R-L-Y. R-A-D-I-O. All right. <clears throat> let's see. So uh, recently this week, um, I have partnered O'Reilly Radio with uh, one of our friends over at EpicProgress.com to do a daily Trump damage report. Um, so I'm adding that directly into this feed, and uh, it's just going out as a podcast. And, of course, you'll also be able to see it and the show notes um, directly on on our website, uh, intermingled with the O'Reilly Radio stuff. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned for that. And if you... Um, if you like what we're doing, let us know. If you don't like what we're doing, let us know. It is, of course, a bit on the liberal side, but, you know, um, well, we're kind of the opposition party at this point, so what did you expect? That's what it's going to be. Um, so also thanks to these daily reports, because if you noticed in the last show, trying to keep up with everything that's going on is mind-numbing. And it's just too much. So it has to be trickled out a little bit at a time. So thanks to, um, thanks to this, it'll allow us to concentrate a little better on some of the, the high points and not have to bog ourselves down with every little bit of minutia. Not that it's small, not that it's unimportant. All of these things are important and we need to know about them, but it's just too much. It's too much for one gasp. So we're going to spread it out a little bit. And then you can dive in and follow all the rabbit trails to your heart's content in all the links on the show notes. And, of course, you can find all those at OReallyRadio.com. Uh, let's see. So also this week, because we're concentrating mostly on, on this week, some, some of the things are going to be older because we just happen to be able to actually talk about things other than politics this week, hopefully. And those will be later on in the show, uh, perhaps in the uh, separate parts that you'll be able to download later. Uh, I saw that JP was almost back on, but not quite. So we'll we'll let her uh, let it percolate a little bit more. What? Well, okay. So to well, it's five to Alt Ed from Scotch when she gets back. Okay. Uh. All righty. We'll definitely. Uh, I I th- I wonder if that's supposed to be an emoji. That's probably an emoji, isn't it? High five. High five? Oh, okay. 
I'm not with it, obviously. That's just terrible. Okay, so the one China policy. Uh, yeah. Trump kind of blew we, we, that we earlier. Covered this. Yeah, Trump blew it earlier by talking out of turn and taking a call from a uh, <laughs> a foreign leader of government uh, I mean, that he shouldn't been, have. It would have been one thing if he just took the phone call and didn't necessarily discuss the phone call or publicize it. Um, yeah. Just be polite, keep it under the table, that's fine. But he blew this thing up with him taking the phone call from the leader of Taiwan, mm -hmm. um, ignoring the one China policy, uh, which has been pretty much how we do diplomacy with China for quite some time. It really is. Uh, and since that happened, uh, China hasn't bothered to have any communication with us at all. Uh, well, I wouldn't say none. It, it, it's, it's none, happened through none with other the surrogates. Um, again, his uh, meeting with uh, the one tech giant with Alibaba, um, that was probably the, the, the first backline diplomacy that according, was being done. According to Trump's uh, personal Twitter, they spoke uh, yesterday. Him and Mr. Is it G? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, they actually, well, what happened was uh, they, apparently the silence was deafening, and Trump actually sent a, a handwritten letter to <laughs> the president. Um, it was it was in, crayon? in crayon? There it is. <laughs> the, no, he, he, that's Great actually a, a typical Trump thing to do is when he wants to ingratiate, communicate, yeah, ingratiate really himself. communicate, uh, he'll do a handwritten letter. It breaks out the gold sharpie. You know, I bet it he just it drew out was. the "Are you mad, bro?" meme. <laughs> oh wow, that that'd be no. kind of typical. But no, it uh, it apparently was enough to thaw the ice, to melt the ice between the two of them. And uh, and sure enough, after that, there was a lines of communication and a face to face meeting and an awkward handshake, and it was well, done. No, that that oh, that was, we're that missing was Asia. That was Japan. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, as for for China, it's a, a phone call. Um, he he finally was able to call the prime minister. I think I'm back. Hey, welcome <laughs> we back. Go. Welcome back. Okay, <clears throat> so we were just talking Wait. about the uh, the one China policy. Oh, so. that fiasco. Yes. Um, well, again, it's it's moved forward. It things may be slightly patched up considering that we've heard from multiple sources that China's prepping for some form of conflict whether it be economic or military why not both <laughs> they're big enough they could they could certainly do both that's that's a possibility um also, uh, you, you have a high five, JP, from, uh, from Scotch. Oh, hi. <laughs> so there you go. So, yes, uh, you can change the way the show goes by participating in our chat by, uh, sure. by immediately distracting us from whatever we're doing with, uh, with, <laughs> shi with shiny words on the screen. And, of course, those will also show up uh, on the video, which will be archived out at YouTube. Okie dokie. So that happened. And uh, then moving on. So... Um, you know, apparently being the president is a tough job. If you've ever looked at the pictures of, you know, the the first day inauguration and then four years in and then eight years in, you can see the weight of the world and what it has done to people. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it, one of the ones that was the most telling actually was W. Oh, yeah. That yeah. when he got out, it wasn't eight years. It was 16 years. At least. Yeah, but even yeah. Obama went really gray really quick. Well, when you have stuff like um, war going on and you have to mm -hmm. deal with the deaths of men, men you have sent to die. I will also say that he has two teenage daughters. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm, that I'm, is also true. I'm You're not gonna, wrong. I'm just going to point also, out that well, that's and then at all least the ha- stuff that Obama had to deal with half. from being our first black president. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, not forget they also said did yeah. a bunch of scientific studies and everything else, and the stress and everything else of just being president takes at least ten years off of your life. Yeah. So it's close so, with the six, sixteen estimate. Yeah, not bad, nice. not bad. So, um, uh, Trump apparently doesn't like it so much. I know it's a it's a shock. You can always quit, <laughs> Donnie. If you're listening, if you're out there, you can quit. It, it it's perfectly fine. You have a wonderful, wonderful empire just waiting to welcome you back. <laughs> Something along those lines. Um, yeah, there, there's an article out on Politico. Uh, Trump vexed by challenges and the scale of government. The new president's allies say he's been surprised that government can't be run like his business. No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> Being president is harder than Donald Trump thought, according to his aides and allies, who say that he's growing increasingly frustrated with the challenges of running the massive federal bureaucracy. Well, you probably should have done some research about the position before applying. He doesn't (laughs) notes. What? He doesn't read notes. He doesn't attend briefings. He doesn't do those things. Again, let's be be fair. (laughs) This is the first job. He's ever had our dear leader has ever applied for. That's true. This he does is have the a first perfect record job he's had. Yeah, he does have well, a perfect record at least. I I do want to while we're on the subject of reading mm-hmm. talk about how dumb that conspiracy theory that Trump literally cannot read is. He reads plenty. Yeah. he reads Twitter. He's just willfully not reading things. He's Correct. not illiterate, yeah. guys. Yeah, no, Come he can now. read Twitter. That is true. I I don't how do you, proven. How do you know he's reading Twitter? Well, he responds to it enough, and he was doing it before he took the presidency, so... Awesome. But if I have tweets. somebody trained to read me a tweet and then type it for oh. me, I mean, I can spell the words. <laughs> I will be playing the part of David this evening. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see. I didn't know that we had a stand in. How bad could it be? How bad Where's your tinfoil hat? I have it on. I'm just not on video. So yeah, that's, that's, fire it. Shack and t- that's it, exactly. Okay, so tasteful, um, tasteful tinfoil beret. Tasteful side tinfoil. <laughs> nice. That's different, it's a, Steve. It's a tinfoil visor. I'm not protecting my brain at all. He's legit. <laughs> the administration is considering. How you let the thoughts out? The administration is considering limiting the universe of aides with access to the to the calls or their transcripts, said one administration official, adding that the leaks and Trump's anger over them had created a climate where people are very careful who they talk to. So you have an entire administration in the West Wing that is walking on eggshells. White House High School. Well, You can't sit with us. Let's, let's, first let's be fair and then let's be thorough. Mm -hmm. Um, To be fair, Every administration, when they first come in, there's a bit of a shakedown period where the people who are going to get along and get with it and those who are going to ship out soon, they, they go through their paces. Um, you don't typically have a solidified cabinet and those in their positions and will be holding for up to nine, 12 months. Um, that's being fair, but be thorough. We have never had a White House leak this much. There are people who are going to try and make their bones just by being there and seeing the train wrecks go by and then making book deals. Um, th- this is a mess. And also being thorough, you have people who have no experience in government no understanding of constitutional law Mm -hmm. if we can give obama nothing else he had a great understanding and respect for the constitution um okay shall we look at sean spicer though (laughs) do we have to um that i feel bad for the poor man he has no business in that position However, he's I don't feel bad for him at all. <laughs> he's been he's in been the Republican National Committee for 
a long time. You know, he, he has no business being in front of a press pool. None. He can't handle it. I this will, is somebody I will say you keep behind closed doors. I will say though that he has um, he's taken SNL with stride. <laughs> That's he, true. He has taken that with stride. Much better than his boss. Way better than his boss. His now boss I, is more interested in presentation than yeah. actual policy. I can't wait for Rosie O'Donnell, though. Oh, oh my God. God. And Christine Baranski. Oh, it's the one thing that the Trump administration has been thorough with. They have made comedy. They have made SNL great again. Yeah, they have done that. And, th- and that's a, that's it, a hard sell. <laughs> what, wasn't it to Massanola two years shows ago? Or that there was a discussion of a, a, a hero is only as good as his villain, and let's face it, the the the, the Trump the, the Trump government is one hell of a villain. Yes. Yeah, it's it's straw manning itself. It's making it so because in the straw man fallacy, you set up something that's easy to knock down. They're setting themselves up so easy to knock down. It's not. It's not challenging. It's not a straw man fallacy when they are literally straw men. Yeah, <laughs> there is that. Okay, so enough of uh, enough of that. Uh, yeah, it's it's a tough job. We we can definitely get behind that tough job. Well, he, he's These are amateurs it as a Monday to Friday job. Let's let's look at this. Yeah, he wants to take weekends in Florida and things like that. Well. Okay, inauguration, he didn't start, after the inauguration, he didn't start until Monday. Mm-hmm. He's, he, he took a weekend in Mar-a-Lago th- th- this past weekend. Mm-hmm. He's going to Mar-a-Lago again. He's treating this as a Monday through Friday job. And it's mm-hmm. really not. <laughs> no. This is a 24-7 gig. Uh, I mean... The one who, who, in my opinion, took like the least vacation. No, internet, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if you go back to H. W. Bush, um, when he took vacations, it was most often to Camp David, which has everything already set up. Should something go wrong, or should a president be needed? That's that's accurate. That's accurate. That is, or uh, I think there was also. There was another location that was also equally set up, um, you know, beyond just having the football, you know, the the portable briefcase with all the codes. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it did did well with things like that. I will say that. Um, of course, H W was also the head of the CIA before he, he became vice president. He already oh, understood well, the idea of a twenty four seven job. He was incidentally. Yeah. I'm he seeing was well as equipped. of. 2015, Obama had taken the least amount of vacation days of any president since Jimmy Carter. Wow. And yet they say that he was golfing all the time. All facts. Repeat a lie often enough it becomes believed as the truth. Yep. No, he had a golden tea arcade in the Oval Office. What? <laughs> That's funny. A virtual golf game. Oh, okay. That's kind of awesome, actually. Why not? Like, if you're the president, why not have a virtual golf game? It lowers, Just it lowers, saying. Yeah, lowers the stress. Might as well. Also, I need I, to stop talking with my hands. This is a podcast. <laughs> ah, but you see, you're also on video. Yeah. And so it's just encouraging th- people to go. I see, I'm talking with my hands, too. It's okay. This we, doesn't translate to radio. No, it, it's true. That's true. You just have to have the words to go along with the motion. Uh, at this point, it's just enraged shrieking. Shrieking yells. Got it. Okay, so speaking of shrieking eels, the fourth estate, journalism, <laughs> has had its Good ups segue. and downs during the uh, the race to the White House. It looks like the uh, like Rupert Murdoch and company, uh, who own almost all of the media in the world, um, they're feeling a little put out by journalists actually trying to do their jobs, um, and they have uh, that they've been a little too critical of Donald himself and uh, and. The rest of the uh, the White House staff, and they may be being asked to um, kind of rein it in. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, specifically, here, the Wall the Street thing. Journal. Or the quote unquote failing New York Times. Well, mm-hmm. that's not owned by Murdoch, I don't believe. That's why it's failing. Um, <laughs> quote unquote. But, e- <laughs> but even for Murdoch, we, we have had reports numerous times during the election um, that while they, they, they met and, and Murdoch softened, he doesn't like Donald. He doesn't think he's cut out for the job. Well, that's probably why they've gotten as far as they have. But at at the same time, uh, Murdoch would definitely be on the the red team. Oh, most definitely. But he, I put in the same you know box as the Koch brothers. They want a particular kind of Republican. They, they want a controllable Donald. Republican, not just controllable, Predi- but predictable. reliable. Yeah, not a uh, not a loose cannon. No. And I've got definitely something on loose cannons here in a little bit, and that, that's going to be a topic. Um, so you can follow that Politico article and and, and fi- find out more about uh, about all that. But the uh, public policy polling uh, research data uh, firm, I guess, when I, I don't know what kind of company they are. It's a polling company. So public policy <laughs> polling. Big one. A big company called Public Policy Polling <laughs> released data showing that Trump and his policies are um, disliked. Yeah, I've seen, as much but as you don't say, about this, but yeah, even the, we so. You know, the questions were asked, like, you know, do you think? And this is the nice thing about this is they actually did a full breakdown, and it is not like okay, we're just doing one party, we're just doing the other. They do have a breakdown in certain things where. Okay, what do Republican voters or what do specifically Trump voters think about this? But in a, in a generalized, you know, across the board, they ask things like, you know, do you think America is safe or unsafe as a country? Sixty-six percent of Americans say that it's safe. Um, who do you consider uh, to be able to make the right decisions for the country? Are, are you more like think Trump can do this, or are you more along the lines of you think judges can do this? Um, 53% of voters say they trust judges more than Trump. Um, yeah. Well, and interestingly enough, there was a thing going around Twitter asking Trump voters what he would have to do to make them no longer support him. And the answers were really interesting. Mm. Get that in a minute. Yeah, I want to hear that. But yeah, yeah that, like, that, that you know, how voters, how considered voters wait about t- Trump taking away Obamacare? Uh, 47% of voters support the ACA. The one that was interesting that I saw was essentially oh. the American public is evenly divided, forty six percent and forty six percent about impeaching Trump, and you kind of go, wait, what? Well, how how is it dead even? But then they went into a deeper question because this is like forty or sixty question full test. Yeah, they said, okay, would you who who would you rather have as president, Trump or Pence? And mm. It was Trump, a little bit behind, and then a little behind him was Pence, but there was a 32% group of we don't know, oh. which we'd prefer, which explains oh. that 46 to 46 dead on. Wow. Oh. Wow. Because, uh. Yeah, it's Trump, but Pence. Okay, so if you're mm. a right wing evangelical, you know, that group, mm. you want Pence. <laughs> Because Pence has the proven track record of being predictable, and he's already made those decisions in Indiana. And he knows how to work the system. Mm -hmm. That's right, Daniel. They are undoing most of the things that he did, uh, which really And it's a Republican, you know, controlled state. Mm -hmm. The governor's Republican. Yep. They're undoing most of Pence's stuff. It was too much. No. It was too much. He went went way too far, um, but then there's Trump, who, wow, man, he's just he's so many things. There's <laughs> there's so many words that I can't. They all want to come out at once, and it sounds like bah, <laughs> it's bah. Uh, so, well, while you're working on those words, let me fill in a little bit for you because you asked a question earlier. Um, public policy polling. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, just to, to give a little bit of information on them, is a U.S. Democratic polling firm based in Raleigh, North Carolina, founded in 2001 by businessman Dean Debnam, who is currently the president and chief executive officer of public policy polling. Uh, they have been said to lean left uh, as of 2013, but in 2016, Nate Silver said they uh, definitely had a right lean um, basically starting about September 2016. In addition to political issues, the company has polled the public on topics such as the approval rating of God, whether Republican voters believe President Obama would be eligible to enter heaven in the event of the rapture, <laughs> whether hipsters should be subjected to a special tax for being annoying, yes. and whether Ted Cruz is a Zodiac killer. Oh, absolutely, he is. Uh, I mean, I, I love this company. It's great. I am... I am. I don't know why I, I'm at this. I fully, like, fully support the hipster tax. Um, I'm going to lie. One of the things, and I would have to do a little bit more reading into it to determine, is is basically what they do is an interactive voice polling system. So they call people and basically roll, run through the polls. But the way they huh. get to the numbers they need to or want to get to is through weighting the polls. And uh, again, I don't know enough to know whether or not this is a, a bad or a normal practice but essentially what they'll do is is let's say they have like 86 percent white people responding and 14 percent black people responding they'll essentially extrapolate out to meet the numbers that they need to meet if it said they needed to meet like 7327 mm -hmm. okay I, so they're they're, they're waiting the statistics i yes. think that's normal it, that's yeah. that's just establishing what the baseline is you know, it, it it's massaging the numbers to match the criteria. They, they all yeah. do it. They all do it. But really, well, other questions are on here? you need a that lot more people to really make make a, a really decent poll. That's the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sample yeah, size as, always matters. Yeah. As we were talking about Saturday Night Live earlier, it's like one of the questions. Question 24. Who do you think has more credibility, Saturday Night Live or Donald Trump? 48% say SNL. I and, mean... What was it? Fifty-two percent said Trump, or was there another no, option? Forty-three. Okay. See that there's the I don't knows. It, there's a ten percent. In Warren, we sure. trust. <clears throat> okay. So, however, when it came to the question about would you, uh, do you think millions of people voted illegally in the 2016 election? Fifty-five percent said no. Okay. Well, obviously, they're not actually polling Trump supporters. Because, let's see, where was that? Is that no, there are the, some. Is um, that in the rundown? That is in the rundown. Let's move right down to a poll indicates that 51% of Trump supporters polled believe that the Bowling Green Massacre is totally legit. Never mm. forget. Never Actually, remember. Actually, never remember. Never forget to remember. What? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Actually, you know, you know what poll it is that said that? Which? This one. Ah, well, excellent. So it was a great segue. There we go. Uh, so yeah, <clears throat> polls are polls are interesting. You know, we we do need them for data, but you know, we can't necessarily rely on them to be completely accurate because it's not. I wasn't polled. It, it gives us a rough estimate. Yeah. yeah but... If you're interested, they actually have the full sixty-page PDF breakdown on their site that you can get and look at. Sixty pages. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, the. Because it's the actual question, the main questions, and then they also have the other breakdowns of, yeah, the Bowling Green Massacre takes up a couple pages going, okay, based off of uh, women and, you know, women or men, uh, Hillary Clinton supporters, Trump supporters, etc. And that's, they do a full, a good breakdown. Well, that's... Data-wise, I like it. That's good, because then you can, you can then take and extrapolate different data out of that poll. So that that's that's a good scatter shot technique to you know be able to break it down in that at least they've got all that itemized out. So that's mm -hmm. that's good technique. That's good technique. So interesting. Uh, federal agents conduct immigration enforcement raids in at least six states. Oh yep. yeah. It's so, yes, ugly. It it has begun. Uh, which one of you brought this story to us? I did. What do you got to say about it? Uh, that it sucks. <laughs> like, Fair enough. 
Boom, done. <laughs> uh, U.S. immigration authorities arrested hundreds of undocumented immigrants in at least a half dozen states this week in a series of raids that marked the first large scale enforcement of President Trump's January 26th order to crack down on the estimated 11 million immigrants living here illegally. So much for doing things humanely. Yeah. The raids, which officials said targeted known criminals, also netted some immigrants who did not have criminal records, an apparent departure from similar enforcement waves during the Obama administration that aimed to just corral and deport those who had committed crimes. Immigration officials confirmed that agents this week raided homes and workplaces in Atlanta, Chicago, New York, the Los Angeles area, North Carolina, and South Carolina, netting hundreds of people. But Jillian Christian, a spokeswoman for the Department of Homeland Security, which oversees Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, said they were part of routine immigration enforcement actions. ICE dislikes the term raids and uh, prefers to say authorities are conducting targeted enforcement actions. If I may? You may. They were targeting elementary schools and middle schools, picking up people who were getting their kids. That's not routine. That's bullshit. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> no. If that's routine, that's just awful. I think it's it can be both. Really, but, wow. really nasty. <laughs> Yep. ICE agents in the Los Angeles area Thursday swept a number of individuals into custody over the course of an hour, seizing them from their homes and on their way to work in daytime operations. Yep. That's a video that awesome. circulated on social media Friday appeared to show ICE agents detaining people in an Austin shopping center parking lot. Apparently, there were also roadway checkpoints where ICE appeared to be targeting immigrants for random ID checks in North Carolina and in Austin. This is not how the country is supposed to be run. This is not how you're supposed to go about doing humane law enforcement. Somebody changed my word. <laughs> What? Well, <clears throat> and finally, <laughs> Donald Trump may have an unprecedented move <laughs> up his sleeve. No, 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 no. I wanted it spelled that way. Somebody edited me. Yes, it's unprecedented as well, but no, it's definitely unprecedented. Um, That's fair. <clears throat> Dan Rather's uh, organization, News and Guts, uh, was re repeating something that the Associated Press uh, brought up. And this, uh, this disturbs me greatly, okay? President Donald Trump says, there we go, okay. President Donald Trump says that he's considering signing a new executive order on immigration as the one he signed suspending the nation's refugee program and barring citizens from seven Muslim-majority countries is held up in court. Trump tells reporters that aboard Air Force One on his way to Florida that he's confident he'll win the court battles. But he says... Quote, we also have a lot of other options, including just filing a brand new order. We need speed for reasons of security, so it could very well be that we do that. Trump says a new order would likely change, quote, very little from the first, and, he's, and says he'll likely act next Monday or Tuesday. He adds of the decision, I'd like to surprise you. I would like to not be surprised. So right. there's a debate Freaking tactic. Host. There's a debate mm -hmm. tactic called the Gish Gallop. And in the Gish Gallop, you present ideas and topics so quickly that it takes yeah. your debate opponent so long to unpack and refute all the things that you said that essentially the guy that was doing the galloping sounds like you, you couldn't possibly, you know, counteract what he said. I'm likening yeah. this action where a president just keeps putting the same executive order out, but worded slightly differently, which gives it another number, which then has to be addressed separately. Yep. The same kind of tactic. And there's nothing well, that prevents him from doing this. And this is the same tactic he used 
in the presidential run. It's the I create nothing but scandal after scandal. You can't dwell on any one. The yeah. cycle because you're having to cover it. But the cycle oh, wait, has to move here's on. another one. Yeah. You don't get to dwell. You don't get to build the story. You don't have the time. You don't have time to process it. What yeah. I love is the names. Like the Gish Gallop, also known as Proof by Verbosti and the Trump Tarad. Oh, the, oh, he has one's own. Ooh. He has his own. He has yeah, like also that. the Trump Tarade. Yep. Trump like tirade. That. Tirade. Trump tirade. 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 That's beautiful. So yeah, there you there you have it. Um, that's what he's doing, but with executive orders. That's the plan. Let's see. Okay, Which, and I I fully get it's disastrous. what what you see in that that would be an issue, Andy. Yeah. But at the same time. They'll just be countered the same way the first one was like and when you're saying I'm going to surprise you because I'm going to put these orders out. It's just giving those lawyers that much more to like they can just draft essentially the same motion and have it ready so that when they see the new order, they can change the wording and have that motion out in much more rapid fire time than what they did the first time around because remember the first time around. There were people detained, and there was all this time it took before we actually got to yeah. some kind of like stoppage. Okay. Well, the, on well, Fred, why did they stop? Do you know why they stopped? Why who stopped? Why uh, the Department of Homeland Security was stopped in their actions for detaining people? Uh, if you go through the timelines, you had the different individual judges that all um, were filing. There for it, their area, Boston. It was um, not the judges. The ACLU filed suit. The ACLU filed suit that only covered one area. It didn't. It, it wasn't that ACLU thing. And that's the thing is like this is so nuanced, and mm-hmm. and only certain yes. parts of it are really being pushed as as reported. That people think the ACLU thing clamped down everywhere. It didn't. The ACLU only clamped down in one particular area, and then you had the Boston judge that clamped down in her particular area, and then you had um, judges can't act unless there is a lawsuit. You, um, there has to be a case for a judge mm-hmm. to sign against. Right, so, but that's so because you, be had, you had those lawsuits coming in those okay. different areas, well, but they were only targeting their specific area. Okay, but Fred, and here's the problem with this. All he has to do is make one executive order, and he creates a mountain of paperwork every single time that costs taxpayer dollars and takes all the resources of all of these agencies, whether or not they be an independent law firm that's that's just doing it out of the kindness of their hearts trying to get things working, or, like the ACLU, a charitable organization that is donation-driven. They only have so much money. They only have so many resources. If he just continues to draft and draft and draft, he will wear them down. Because all he has to do is just write another piece of paper, hit print on his golden printer, because I'm sure that it's lacquered in gold. I'm, I'm positive on this. So, you know, an HP LaserJet gold edition or something. And all he has to do is then just sign it, and he'll hold it up for all the cameras again, because that's what he does, over and over and over again, and make everybody jump through all the hoops again until they have no more money to do it with. That is the danger. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be a scary thing, but on the other side, mm-hmm. that's all the lawyers have to do as well. I mean, I yeah, see how money. easy it is to file a lawsuit. It's not hard. I know, but it costs I, I it see it every cost day. money, though. It takes resources. It costs more money than the, it is overwhelmingly in the government's favor on this. They have to defend it. They can just say, okay, fine. You know what? You win. We'll let that one drop. They can settle out of court, essentially, for that. Let it go. Because all he has to do is sign a new one that then has to be addressed the same way again. The odds are not in our favor. The odds are definitely in his favor if this is the tactic that he chooses. It's 
dirty. It's unethical. And it'll probably work. Because I, I can't see how it's illegal. Well, I mean, it's not illegal for him to put out as many orders as he wants to. There's, there's no law in the books that limits the number of orders he can issue. Even in a day. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, w- I wonder, what, what is the number, the highest number of executive orders in a single day that has been issued? Uh, I, I see Google Foo happening right now. <laughs> Excellent. I, I, I would think no more than, I would put below six. Oh, below no, six. no, it's got to be higher than that. Remember Roosevelt. I have stats uh, on the FD. first week, but so yeah, Trump's six executive orders in the first ten days, most in modern era. Yeah, first in ten days, I, I was right, less than the, six. Mo- the most among the thirteen presidents to serve since the end of World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, number of executive orders by every U.S. president. Mm-hmm. But how many? How many yeah, in a that's day? I, I, that's be nothing's better. coming up for day. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen the one by president. The highest number was FDR with 3,721. Dear mm-hmm. Lord. Yeah, but you also have to think of how long he actually served. Also, and remember, also FDR was serving during a war. Yep. He was, was also doing the... Yeah, he, he was doing a lot. I'm sure it was probably an executive order to launch a nuke. Uh, the lowest was William Henry Harrison, to nobody's surprise whatsoever. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. Ah... Uh, Okay, so that's fun in that way that's horrifying. Because I, it, it, just, it just sticks in me that, yeah, that's going to be his tactic. Because it makes sense from a business standpoint. It's oh. bullying. Yeah. It's co- cost-benefit analysis. Barack yeah. Obama is number 16 on that list, underneath Reagan and G.W. Bush. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's very little. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, homework for you, you folks out in, out in listener land. Uh, find out who released the most, and we want the number, executive orders in a single day. I'm, I'm very curious about that. Um, but I think that's probably going to wrap it for uh, for this segment. Unless you guys have anything anything more uh, unprecedented to say about this. No. Oh. Let, let, <laughs> let's move on to more knowledgeable topics. All righty. So if you've enjoyed what we've done here and you'd like to help us out, uh, there's a few ways. You can donate to the show through patreon.com slash radio and get early access to show content. You can uh, also uh, make those algorithms work for us by reviewing us on iTunes to boost our ranking. Uh, use your words and uh, tell someone about us. That's always very helpful. And of course, engage with us directly. Send us a message on the social medias or the electronic mails at Podcast at gmail.com or if you're the more talkative sort, we have that voice line and number at 470-222-ORLY that's a 6759 and it's always ready to take your call or your text if you uh, don't like what we've done here I, th- I think hmm, Amber you take it away if you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones, and best practices for professionals. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been a really Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the music Rocket and Pemgea, created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com. We'll see y'all real soon. Mm-hmm.